uh, in these lectures, I'm going to discuss some aspects of quantization. Can everybody see green on green, or so this was the location part? Okay, so I'm discussing quantization, and the, the motivation is to understand some concepts that have to do with uh, quantizing gauge theory. Uh, now, I'm aware that maybe not all of you have seen gauge theories before or are very comfortable with gauge theories, but for those who have, I'm going to give some motivation. But then, um, uh, like what, what, are, what is the problem we're trying to, to attack? Uh, and why do we need something called BRST? And what is this cosmology and all that? That's, that's going to come. But uh, uh, the, the, the actual uh, today's lecture, and probably part of next time's lecture, is going to be on a much simpler model that is not field theory, just a particle model. Uh, so hopefully it will be easier to, to follow even for those who haven't uh, done QED. But, but the application is the QED and to non engaged case. So let's, let's start. Uh, with just stating um, a few facts about QED. Uh, even if you haven't seen QED, you probably uh, know what QED is supposed to mean. It's quantum electrodynamics, and it's a theory that uh, should be describing, uh, should describe photons uh, ideally interacting with um, electrons and, and other, uh, uh, other matter particles. It could be combined, it could be uh, scalars and some models in, in real life QED, it's of course electrons and quarks and uh, all the matter content of the standard model that, that interacts with you. So the Lagrangian, I'm going to focus only on um, the, the gauge part of the Lagrangian, just to point out some issues. Uh, this is built up on uh, a four vector a mu, uh, which you can think of as the photon. So this is what represents uh, the photon in QED. And what you do is you write down a Lagrangian. I'm going to write down a Lagrangian density, so I'm not integrating over, over space time on this stage, which looks like this. Where now F mu nu is the field strength of, uh, of this um, uh, gauge field, uh, which is defined as this. And now, by, the, by this very definition, you can see that this theory has a very important property. Uh, can anybody tell me what this, what this thing guarantees? There's some symmetry that is encoded in this. But of course, this is made so that it's Lorentzian variant, right? Because all the indices are contracted. So this is a fully relativistic uh, Lagrangian that I'm writing down. But by thinking of the field strength like this, well, that gives us some kind of freedom. Can anybody suggest what this is? So what can I do to the field A that is not going to change anything? A gauge transformation. Right? So if you additionally so I can gauge transform. I can change a mu to be the same field plus d mu of some field or some parameter epsilon, which depends on space time. Of course, everything depends on space time. I mean, here I don't write because it's obviously a field, so it depends on all the four coordinates of space time. But uh, here it's, it's worth mentioning this that uh, this is a parameter which varies along space time. Okay, so we, we have these gauge transformations. And now, I think it's quite easy to, to verify that uh, if I do the transformation, then this um, f mu nu is going to be invariant. Right? Is it clear why? Because uh, uh, then f mu nu is going to be, okay, this is the original one, so that's f mu nu, right? Uh, that doesn't change, but then by, by adding this, then I get something like um, d mu uh, now. A, this, this is going to be a nu, so that's going to have a mu d nu epsilon. So this is going to be a d nu epsilon minus now this is d nu a nu d nu epsilon. Of course, these are just normal partial derivatives; they commute, so these things cancel. 
uh, and then we just get that the field strength is invariant. Okay. So this is what we call a gauge symmetry. And of course, it's a hugely important uh, thing in uh, quantum field theory to have these gauge uh, symmetries. Uh, they essentially guide our choices of, of Lagrangians and sort of the theories that we construct. Uh, they're based on which kind of gauge symmetries we want. In this case, it's a very simple gauge symmetry, uh, which only has one parameter, and it is called abelian. But later, maybe even in these lectures, we're going to touch upon what happens when we look, also look at non-abelian gauge theory. These are theories with many parameters, where if you do different kinds of transformations, they don't commute to each other. So depending on how you do the transformation, you, go, you get different answers. Okay, so that would be a non-abelian case. But for now, we focus on the abelian uh, situation. Okay, so let's uh, discuss what this has to do uh, with um, quantization. So what happens if you want to try to uh, understand this Lagrangian uh, at the quantum level? So I'm going to switch to a notation where time plays a special role. Now, why do I do that? Because what, we, what we're trying to do, what, what I'm going to try to do afterwards, is to canonically quantize the theory. Now, you might have seen canonical quantization before. That's, and of course, that, that's going to be the main topic of these lectures, uh, or at least the starting point of these lectures. But for canonical quantization, you need to impose something called equal time commutation relation. So, so it's a formulation that's explicitly not relativistically invariant, and at least not from the beginning, because time plays a special role, because you impose commutation relations between your operators at a specific time. And then you kind of hope, or you construct it in a way, that uh, relativistic invariance is preserved. But that's sort of not very automatic, and that's part of the problem that I want to uh, emphasize here. So let's make this indices explicit. You get something like this, uh, plus so, okay, so I made the first index mu to be 0, the other one to be i. You can also make it the other way around, f uh, i 0. And then you can also choose the indices mu nu to be, uh, so by 0 in time, and i is 1 to 3, these are the three space indices. And you can also make it uh, the, other, the other term, f i j, f i j. Okay, so, so the usual, uh, this is just space time. So you can see, effectively, we split the Lagrangian into two parts. These, these are the same thing. Uh, this is an anti-symmetric tensor, as you can see from the definition. So I can switch this index, I can switch this index, I get two minus signs, so this is the same as that. Uh, plus. Uh, and uh, this is also a um, uh, three-dimensional this, this three part. But I want to focus mainly on this part. So if I were to write this down, I would get something like minus a half d0 ai minus ti a0 squared. Right? That's what f0 i means. And square. Okay, and plus, or, or let's say my, minus in this case, the one quarter f i j squared. Everybody happy with uh, this way of writing? So now comes the, the interesting issue, which I'm going to be emphasizing more in a simpler case uh, soon. Now look at what happens at the field component A0. I think you can be satisfied that there is no A0 in this part, right? This only contains AI, AJ. So the field component A0 is only really in this part. But, but see what, what happens to it. Uh, which is very important for the context, in the context of quantization. It has a space derivative, but it doesn't have a time derivative. So 
So suppose I were to uh, try to find the, canonic, the, the canonically conjugate momentum to this field. What would that be? Zero, right? Because the canonically conjugate momentum, as we're going to discuss, and I mean it is, is defined as a derivative of the uh, Lagrangian with respect to the time derivative of a field. But for A0, there is no time derivative. Okay, so this already tells you that there's something subtle about this theory. Okay. And uh, that we, we will need to, uh, to understand. So what, what I'm saying here is that for A0, there is no A dot zero in Lagrangian, in the Lagrangian. Okay, I'm gonna put kind of arbitrary down this here upstairs. Uh, I put everything this uh, upstairs in the it's the same thing. Uh, and so that means the canonically conjugate momentum to A0 is zero. And, and another thing I want to mention about this is that, uh, so, so basically the question is, you know, how do we quantize a theory? What is the, what is the canonical commutation relation that I want to impose? Because normally, for a given field, so for, for a field A0, I would like to impose a canonical commutation relation, equal time commutation relation, which looks like this. Okay. Uh, well, actually, maybe, maybe let's go to the quantum level. Okay. So something like this equals, uh, in this case, I would say minus uh, delta x. Okay. So that's what we normally do for a field to quantize. If you see quantization on a scalar field, that, that's, what, uh, what, that's what you did. You took the, the field, you found canonical conjugate momentum, and then you posed a uh, commutator, a non-zero commutator, where somehow h bar should also be here. I'm putting h bar to one, but you should think of also h bar uh, as appearing here, or uh, so the quantum parameter. But but here, obviously, you see that this is not a consistent relation, right? Because this is zero because of the fact that there is no time derivative of a zero. Right? So that leads to some problems. As you can probably imagine that you don't have a well-defined quantization uh, scheme. There's another problem that arises, uh, which you can see even before you try to quantize, which is what happens if you try to calculate the path integral for an, for an action like this. Now, uh, let me remind you what the path integral is. <coughs> the path integral is an integral over da mu over e to the i s, where s is the action that we derive from this Lagrangian. So S is integral d4x of this Lagrangian. All right. Now this is the, this is the fundamental object that we deal with in quantum field theory. Okay, this is canonical quantization. I'm switching to a different kind of way of doing quantum field theory, but we'll see a different problem arising here. Uh, so, so this is the action which depends, of course, on on a new, and this is a it means you integrate over all possible field configurations uh, of uh, the four components. So it's da0, da1, da2, and da3. Okay, that's what this shorthand notation means. You integrate over all possible field configurations. Now, what, what, the, what happens usually in, in, a, in a normal uh, quantum field theory when you try to do a path integral like that? Well, what happens is that some field configurations are uh, lead to actions which are smaller, okay? Uh, so which are and uh, which end up contributing more because the, you see this is a line here, which means that for each configuration when, when you do this, suppose uh, look at some configuration in U uh, of x, and I look at some nearby configuration in U uh, prime of x. Because this is an uh, oscillatory integral, so it oscillates very fast, right? I mean, if, if, a new is a, if, if the action, if S of a mu is a large number, and I, I change my field from a mu to a mu prime, just by a little bit, this is going to be a big difference. And it can come with an arbitrary phase, because, you know, the, the phase here uh, can, can change a lot if it's a big number, and this configuration with a mu is going to more or less cancel the configuration with a mu prime. And that leaves only very few configurations. Now, which are the configurations? 
that are relevant for for this that actually are going to give contribution. I mean, already kind of said it. What do we have to do to the action to be counted? Yeah, the configuration of minimize uh, the action. So, so that's how the method model works. So this is how we recover uh, the idea that you know we're looking at minimal um, uh, that when we take an action, we need to take variations of the action and look for minima or extrema in general, but in particular for minima of the action. Because if you have a minimum of the action, then the first derivative uh, will vanish, right? So the, the configurations just next door to it are, are not going to be very uh, are not going to affect it very much, and you're going to get a contribution from that configuration. And of course, there can be many minima, so many configurations. Okay, that that uh, contribute to the pattern. But now let's see what happens in the case where we have change invariants. So for this discussion, forget everything I said on this part of the blackboard because this was about trying to quantize. This is, you know, we're not even trying to uh, well, we are quantizing because we're doing pattern calls, but we're looking at different kinds of classical configuration. So. Now, obviously, we can think of a configuration where, for instance, a mu of x is zero. Let's think of a configuration like that. Now, what's the action which is written up there for such a configuration? Zero. So, s of this configuration is zero. So, what is e to the i of this action? One. Now let's take another configuration in your front, which is a mu plus the gates variation, the mu epsilon. What is the action for this configuration? Will the action depend on epsilon? No, why not? Yeah, gate symmetry, right? So gate symmetry guarantees that any such configuration for any epsilon we, we decide to use, uh, it gives the same action. And what is the action? Zero. So for all these infinite configurations, because there's an infinite number of epsilons, uh, our actions uh, are e to the action is just one. So what is the path integral if you're integrating one over an infinite number of configurations? Infinite, right? So the path integral diverges, or it's a better way of saying it, it's not well defined in a, in a field with gauge invariants. So something has to happen uh, to, to make the path integral uh, well defined. And what is the usual solution that we choose? For those of you who've seen these kind of um, So if the problem is gauge symmetry, what do we do to gauge symmetry? Yeah, okay, you're going a little bit uh, too far ahead, uh, but, but of course that that's what you should do. I mean, you should divide by these uh, sort of redundant configurations, but in a more basic way. Yes. So that's the, the, the most. That's the first uh, response we have to this problem. If it's the case invariance which leads to these infinities and this divergence, well, then let's break the gauge invariant by adding a gauge fixing term. Right? So you break the invariance by fixing it, which is a strange sort of linguistic uh, statement, but that, that's what you do. So you add gauge fixing. Right? Uh, and there's a simple gauge fixing term that you can, uh, uh, that you can add. Uh, well, there's many, but I'll just give you a couple of choices that, uh, that you can do. One of them is the so-called a0 equals 0 gauge. So basically, you put by hand your a0 component to be 0. Okay? Now, th that, that definitely fixes some of the gauge symmetry. Okay? So that's what one, uh, one common uh, gauge that we can use. And the reason I'm mentioning this one is because it also has a lot to do with this problem here. Suppose you put a0 equals 0 in your, in your action, or in your Lagrangian, then this problematic term is just not there anymore. Right? So, so then you don't have to worry about the, the conjugate momentum to a0, and then you can proceed with the quantization happily, and uh, just, you know, you don't have this, you never need to worry about this 
commutation relation because A0 is just not in the Lagrangian in the first place. So when you quantize, you, know, you don't need it. But what's the problem with this gauge? Well, it has several, but you know, what's the main problem that you can imagine if you do something like this to your uh, nice, well, let me write again the Lagrangian. You have, you have this nice Lagrangian here. And now you're imposing that A0 is 0. What have you broken in this process? Which symmetry? Yeah. Lorentz, right? So this is not Lorentz invariant. Which means that, okay, you're fine, you can use it. Uh, but, and, you know, that's something that we often do also, you might have seen in, uh, in string theory, one often chooses uh, to break explicit uh, Lorentz invariants, but it, it by going to something called the light cone gauge. But in the end, of course, the problem is that you have to guarantee that any final result you get, any correlation function, is going to be Lorentz invariant. So that adds an extra step to the process, and for relatively simple theory like QED, it's not a big deal, uh, but for more complicated theories, uh, like non abelian gauge theories that I discussed, that I, well, I, I mentioned I might discuss. Uh, then this becomes almost an intractable problem. So, so that's uh, uh, so that's why this case I mean, has its uh, advantages, but also has disadvantages. Uh, so that's called a zero equals zero gauge. Uh, another common gauge people use. So, a gauge I mean a choice of gauge fixing term. That it's something you add to your Lagrangian, which is explicitly not gauge invariant. So you break your nice gauge symmetry by adding these terms to your Lagrangian. Um, well, this is something you can impose uh, like that as a constraint. Uh, there's also something called the Coulomb gauge. And uh, this is given by this equals zero. So here now you're imposing, uh, well, this you can think of it as di ai. So you're imposing a constraint not on your uh, a0 component, but on your AI components, so they are the AI, the AI which is here. But of course, this is, uh, you can think of this BI and AI. It has the same problem as the A0 equals 0 gauge, which is that you know, you've explicitly broken an altruistic invariant. Right? So this is also not Lorentz invariant. Right? Because, again, you're only dealing with some components, it's still not all of the components. So you're not dealing with the gauge field symmetry. So you have similar problems. I mean, of course, it's very nice. The Coulomb gauge is really nice, for, in particular, for taking the non-relativistic limits of, uh, of QED and sort of trying to recover, say, Coulomb's law, because Coulomb's law should follow from this direction. So you know, that's a typical gauge one might use in that case. But again, for quantization purposes, then you'll have to you know, make sure that your uh, final answer is relativistic invariant, and that's a bit difficult. Or it complicates things. In QED, it's tractable. In other theories, it becomes very common. In more complicated theory. Typically, what one uses is something called the Lorentz gauge instead, which is defined as d mu a mu. This is also an H fixing term, uh, and it's it has the nice property that it is Lorentz invariant. <coughs> and let me just here mention uh, again a, a small notational uh, confusion that often arises. These are different Lorentz people. Uh, so this is Ludwig Lorentz, who is a Danish uh, physicist. This is Hendrik Lorentz, who was Dutch. So, but because the Lorentz case is Lorentz invariant, then often that T finds its way into the Lorentz case. Uh, but actually, technically, this case was invented by uh, Ludwig Lorentz and not Henry uh, Lorentz. So, they lived around the same time, but they were very different. Uh, okay, so what's the, but the nice thing is Lorentz invariant, what's the bad thing of the Lorentz case? So what happens with the Lorentz gauge is that effectively, remember the problem here was that there was no A0, uh, A0 dot. Effectively what happens with the Lorentz gauge is that an A0 uh, dot finds its way into the Lagrangian. 
by, by adding that gate. Okay. I mean, it's kind of clear because there's a B0, A0. So if you add a term to Lagrange, I'm not going to go through all the details, but you add a term that has an A0, A0, B0, A0. So effectively, you actually recover what you were missing, which was, uh, which was this term. So in terms of quantization, uh, it actually looks much nicer uh, until you sort of look at it a bit more carefully. Uh, which is, so you get a quantization condition like this. AU. AU uh, equals minus i g mu mu times delta delta. Something like this. So now you see that actually all of your components, and that's that because you put an A0 dot in the game for, uh, from the condition, all your components of your, uh, of your gauge field uh, take part in the commutation relation. So you might say, okay, this is great, but until you notice one thing, which is, okay, what is this? It's a metric, right? The Minkowski metric of space. Now I use G, maybe you've seen this beta and other components, right? So what is that metric? So it depends on the convention, but uh, but let's say uh, minus plus plus plus. It's not going to matter very much. What you see from this is that there is a sign difference between one component and the three other ones, whichever whichever convention you choose. And what it leads to, it might be hard to directly see it from here, but if you've thought of quantization before and how commutation relations look like, you, what you'll notice is that the sign here is going to be different from one component. In particular, in this case, for A0, it's going to be different, and uh, it's going to be plus, and the other one's going to be plus. Uh, actually, maybe it might be better to use plus minus one. I think you mean momentum uh, Oh, uh, yeah, but that is actually... Oh, yeah, sorry, I mean, I mean it doesn't. So let's actually use plus minus minus to make this one clear. Sorry, now for changing the convention. Yeah, so, okay, I, mean, I will discuss QED a bit in more detail probably in the last lecture. So, you know, then you'll see how this comes out. So what this has to do with uh, why this, why this the current logical momentum to A0. Um, but uh, if, you, uh, if you take this metric, you see that this is a minus and the other components have pluses. And that means that A0 is going to lead uh, to negative norm states. Okay. That's what happens if you, you have commutation relations for which some of them are, are minuses and some of them are pluses. Okay. So some of the states you create, so how do you create states? Well, this you associate with some creation operators, A plus zero, and then you act on some vacuum and you create states in the usual way that you, you, know, you quantize. So, similar to, you know, also the harmonic oscillator in, in quantum mechanics and all that, you just create uh, creation annihilation operators and you define a vacuum using your annihilation operators and then you create states. But some of these states are going to have an equative norm. Now, for those of you who have seen QED, is it a problem to have some states having negative norm? It, it sounds bad, but is it actually in practice bad? Because there's, there's two questions about it. I mean, the question is not really where they exist. Okay, yes, you do have some negative norm states. But the, the question one should ask is, do these negative norm states interfere with what we call physical states. So do they, you know, affect the probabilities that, you know, like to calculate using correlation function okay. for, uh, for the physical states that we want. So what, what do we need to calculate here? We need to calculate some amplitude. So some probability for some field configuration to evolve into some other field configuration. Um, uh, so, or, you know, so you, you put some external gauge fields and you want to find the probability for, you know, the interaction of these gauge fields. Now, if you can prove that these negative norm states, if you start with only physical states externally, that these ones do not interfere 
with, um, uh, so they don't interact with any of your physical states, then you can sweep this problem under the carpet and not worry about it. And that's what people do in QED. Uh, we'll, I'll give a more technical statement about this in terms of uh, ghosts decoupling okay, uh, at, um, at a later stage. But, uh, but that's what we do. Uh, so in QED, that's not a big deal, actually. So we can live with it and we'll quantize the theory and calculate everything we want and we're happy even though this problem exists. But if I want to go to a non-abelian gauge theory, uh, like QCD, the theory of the strong interaction, then this problem comes back and it doesn't allow us to you know, properly calculate correlation functions because these states actually interact um, in a non-trivial way with our physical states. Uh, the technical statement again is that ghosts uh, do not decouple. So they're interacting with uh, ghosts in the system. So then we actually need to worry a bit more about this. Uh, and that's, uh, so we need a better way and to, to run the theory. And th there is a procedure uh, that I'm not going to review now because I want to go to a much simpler system. Uh, but uh, it started uh, with uh, Fadev and Popov, who introduced the notion of um, ghosts um, in, uh, in, in uh, quantizing a theory and in how, to, how to impose the gauge constraints and all that. And it evolved uh, later into the, the BRST method of quantization which is what I want to focus on in this time. So I'll kind of bypass some of, some of the five of parts and uh, talk directly about BRST, which is, has more on this. Sorry, Professor, but there is a to introduce tiny curve of at this moment is because of the negative norm state. Uh, yeah, it's a more consistent way of, uh, of quantizing <laughs> than just, just adding a condition. I mean, uh, because at the same time you're extending your Hilbert space by adding these ghosts in the system. Okay, and um, I'm, I'm saying this because yes, uh, th these ghosts that you introduce using Fadev Popov, which are a technical tool there. Uh, for those who've seen it, the reason you introduce ghosts is because you want some anti-commuting fields to give you some kind of determinant, uh, which has to do with the gauge fixing term. Okay, so jargon kind of you can ignore if you haven't seen it. Uh, so, so you can use these ghosts, uh, which you know help you to, to do this process in a more consistent way. But what I'm going to do today is sort of not even worry about this and just stating it, and, and talk about the BRST method, which also uses the same ghosts, uh, but in a more sort of uh, in, a, in a more clear way, where it's clear what you're trying to do. What you're trying to do with the BRST method is you want to gauge fix your theory. It's just like Father Popov also wants to, you know, you want to gauge fix, so you want to get rid of the annoying gauge invariance, but while preserving an, an interesting remnant of gauge invariance at the same time, which is called the RST symmetry. So instead of the gauge transformations, you're, you're not just breaking it uh, with, uh, you know, no, no worries about the world. I mean, you actually break it in a way that you're keeping uh, a global remnant called BRST symmetry. And this is very helpful in, in proceeding to, to quantize further the theory, as, as we will see, hopefully. Okay, so I've used up about half my time on this. Uh, so, but I think, uh, are there any more questions? Because I'm gonna, now, you can forget everything I've said about gauge theories at the moment, and uh, I'm going to start with the actual model that I want to discuss today, which is a much simpler classical Lagrangian this field theory. What I would like, what I would like to, you know, hopefully uh, make clear with this discussion is what is the problem, okay, in, uh, in field theories where you have gauge invariance, uh, or in any systems with gauge invariance. The problem is there's usually a tension between Lorentz symmetry and gauge invariance. So you can, you can fix one, but then you break the other. You would like to have both. Okay, so in the best of all worlds, you'll be able to have both gauge invariance and Lorentz invariance, but not having an infinite path at the same time. So how do you achieve all that in, in one package? 
That's BRST symmetry, or the BRST method. Of course, it does break the invariance, but in a, in a useful way. Uh, that definitely uh, preserves covariance and um, sort of makes it clear what are your physical states uh, and, and all that. So you can restrict to a subset of physical states where everything uh, makes sense. Okay, so is that, um, if that's okay, then I'll just move to a, to a different system. A toy model, if you like. And for this, uh, I'll be discussing Um, I mean, I'll be following the, uh, a review article called the BRST Primer. Uh, by Nemesamsky. Um, let's see. Prime. Prime right. And so if you look for it, you're going to find this. Um, and it's in Annals of Physics. I can give you the full reference if you want. So I'll be following uh, almost exactly their, their logic and their procedure. So you know, if some of what I say doesn't make sense, uh, then you can always look uh, at that reference for, for more, more detail. Okay, so what do they consider? So they want to, do, to understand the same problem that I'm trying to understand, uh, which is uh, how do you quantize theories with gauge invariants? But uh, they do it in this, you know, one of the simplest possible models, which has gauge invariants, uh, which is what they call a classical. So the, the rest of today, and probably much of the next time, will be uh, dealing with this simple system. So what is the system? You look at the, you're looking at a particle, uh, which is moving in the x, y plane. Okay. So what's the Lagrangian for a free particle in the x, y plane? Classical no relativistic things. Three particles. Alpha x dot uh, x dot plus y dot. Yeah. Uh, or you can you can think of it as just it's the classical kinetic energy, right? So so then you just write you can write it as yeah half m x dot plus one half. Okay, everybody happy with this is a free particle moving on the x dot. But now, okay, of course this would be slightly trivial to, to quantize, uh, but uh, let's uh, impose a constraint. The constraint is that this particle uh, is constrained to live on a circle. So it lives in some circle of gravity radius A. Okay, so well, this, is, this is the radial coordinate R. Okay, actually, A. So how do I impose this constraint on this particle? So what, what, what is the radius? R equals? R squared equals x squared. Yeah, so this is x squared plus y squared. And what is the constraint? If I wanted to only live, so this is my particle, and I wanted to only live on this Circle. R equals A. Now, how do I impose R equals A in a Lagrangian? So, I want to write down the Lagrangian for this, but I wanted to take into account this constraint here, that R equals A. Maybe you've seen this before, but you haven't. So, what I want to do is I want to impose this constraint as an equation of motion. So I want to add another uh, variable in my system, or we're not call it field now, but these are not fields, they're just variables, so it's x and y. Uh, we're just doing you know, normal mechanics. 
But I would like to add another uh, variable in my system whose equation of motion imposes the constraint. And I'll call this variable lambda. And I will see why it imposes the constraint. Does anybody maybe know how we call each kind of variables? Lagrange. Lagrange multiplier. So this is a Lagrange multiplier. So it's a non-dynamical field. How do you know it's non-dynamical? It doesn't depend on time. It doesn't depend on time. In other words, there's no kinetic term. Okay, so I didn't add any kinetic term to this variable, like I add for y and, and x. So it's, it's not dynamical, it just stays the same. This is going to change later. Okay. Uh, but for the moment, think of it as just a normal Lagrange motion. Okay, so what are the questions of motion of our system? Uh, there's obviously going to be, so we're going to do the Lagrange method. Right? So we're going to have. Um, so it's going to be here with pt stops, right? Minus uh, dx. And if you if you do that, you see d all over dx dot, that's going to give you m x dot. Right? Uh, so I might take the derivative of that, what do you get? Mass is constant, right? So I'm going to uh, minus now dl over dx. Uh, so that is, uh, uh, then you have to be a bit more careful because there's an x inside r. Right? So, so let's, uh, let's do that's the only place where x appears without the derivative, so this is what we should focus on. So what we, uh, what we get? Well, we need to calculate uh, dr over dx. Which is d of square x plus y over dx, which is going to be, let's see, it's uh, 1 over 2 x squared uh, plus y squared. Plus, and correct me if I'm wrong because we didn't think that word. And so x over 5. Is there anything? Okay, so then we get this minus. Uh, Lambda over R. But don't forget the lambda over there. There is the ground. Okay. So that's uh, one of our equations of motion. The other equation of motion is going to be for Y. So first, very similar. DL, DL, DY dot times DL, DY equals M Y double dot. Minus lambda one. And finally, we have more one more equation of motion, right? Which is some of the, the point of what we're trying to do. And that's the question of motion for lambda, our Lagrange multiplier. So we should also, I mean, uh, in, in this way, the positive constraint, we should also look at the question of motion of lambda. And what does it give us? Of course, there's no lambda dot, so we forget about this term. So we only focus on this term. And dl over d lambda is going to give us simply r minus a. And of course, we get all the grams that's only to zero. Right? That's all the grams. So we've imposed our constraint. I'm going to give this a name and call, call this phi. Because as always, when you're sort of dealing with uh, any kind of Lagrangian, and you have to make sure you, you distinguish between, uh, uh, you know, some um, expression and the same expression after you impose equations of motion. Right? So when you impose the equations of motion of one of your fields, in this case lambda, then this is zero. But it's not zero in general. The off shell. One, this is not zero, it's only zero on shell after you impose the question. So it would be wrong to say that phi is zero. Phi is your constraint. 
this is the constraint that we have. Okay. So far so good. Uh, okay, so let's also do one more thing. Uh, let's write down the Hamiltonian for the system. Uh, now, what's the Hamiltonian? How's the Hamiltonian related to Lagrangian? Yeah, but in the Gantic term, we usually also use instead of, you know, when you write a Hamiltonian, you move from the coordinates and the derivatives to the momentum, right? To the continuum. So, okay, I'm not going to go through the details, uh, but if you were to write down the Hamiltonian for the system, you would get something like px squared over 2m plus py squared over 2m, where these are the momenta corresponding to the, uh, and you can find the momenta, obviously, right, by the individual Hamiltonian. Methods again derived to Lagrangian with respect to the uh, to x dot or y dot. <coughs> That's going to give you this the momentum uh, plus because the, the, the potential comes with a minus uh, in the Lagrangian, so it comes with a plus plus lambda r minus a. Note that there is no conjugate momentum for lambda because there is no lambda. Dot. Now comes the step where we want to, you know, this was all classical, okay, we know, we understand classical what's going on. Now comes the step where we want to start quantizing the system. So, we are going to do the nominal quantization. Okay, so what does canonical quantization mean? Post-computation relations between what? Between uh, coordinates and their conjugate momentum. Yeah. Right? So in a in a more step-by-step -step process, first you form the Poisson brackets, yeah. and uh, which uh, uh, which are sort of classical, and then you upgrade them to quantum computation relations by essentially you know adding. If, I mean, you know, from the original definition of Poisson brackets, and just uh, thinking of the commutator as an operator uh, equation, and somehow an h bar appearing in the problem. Uh, so this is the, the canonical procedure for how, how to quantize, and of course you can motivate many ways, but I'm not going to focus on um, uh, on the uh, on the motivation here. Uh, I'm just going to impose commutation relations, and the commutation relations are going to be, as you're familiar with, x of px. That's going to be i. Usually there's an h bar there, but I put h bar to 1. It's, it's a typical thing that everybody does. And if I, can, if I try to add an h bar to this, uh, then I'm sure I'm going to get it wrong and sort of further equations down because the paper has h bar equals 1. So let me stick to this. You can always get back uh, h bar back, thinking a bit about uh, dimensions. And I'm also going to impose y with dy, the conjugate variable, dy. Now, what happens if I do x with y? Zero, right? These are not conjugate variables, so this is zero. The same with dx, dy is zero. And uh, the same with x and dy, and y and dx. Down, but they're not going to be variable, so the only non trivial computation relations I have, so far at least, are these two. Okay, so if this, was a, if this were a normal uh, situation, we would be happy, and you know, there would be uh, this, this would be the computation of the system. Right? So then you, you can start creating states. Like you would do the harmonic oscillator, but okay, this is a free particle, so it would be even uh, uh, slightly different than the harmonic oscillator, but that's it. But here we have our constraint, and the the problem starts when you realize that the Hamiltonian, if you commute the Hamiltonian to the constraint, these things do not commute. 
Now, what does it mean for the Hamiltonian not to commute to the constraint? What does the Hamiltonian generate? Take a state if you have the Hamiltonian. Time translation. So that means that suppose you impose a constraint at some moment in time, and uh, then during the time evolution of the system, the constraint is going to be violated. So the part is going to move off your circle and sort of do its own thing. So the Hamiltonian does not respect the constraint. So that, that's, uh, that's the problem that we face when we try to quantize a theory of constraints, at least in, 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 this, in this case. Now let's, let's see this first. Okay, it's better to be a little bit more explicit, and uh, then we can um, uh, see with how to deal with, uh, with this problem. So uh, let's, uh, let's see how to... I, I think uh, to see this, we need to look at um, the commutator of R with, say, uh, Px. Uh, now, what is the function of R of Px? Because you know Px is part of Hamiltonian, so you know to, to, to see that this is not uh, uh, zero, we first have to do these commutators. So R of Px, uh, that is uh, this with Px, and so now how do I deal with this? I mean, I know what Px is with x. I know that commutator is i, but how do you deal with this slightly more complicated thing? Can we think of better responding in terms of that? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's how you would deal with this. I mean, just, again, there's a more formal way of thinking of the commutators and derivation, but, uh, but I think the simplest thing is to think of Taylor expanding this. Uh, so you would get, okay, uh, so what you would get in the end would be something like uh, 1 over 2 x squared plus y squared times, uh, I guess there's a 2, and then there's the x uh, 2x, something like this. And I'm kind of skipping a few, a few steps. So, so you see that now I get this x px, that is equal to i, so I'm getting i x over This is a little bit fast, perhaps, but yeah, think about it a little bit more carefully of how you do it. And R with PY is the same thing. Uh, we would get that uh, 
5 is 1 over 2m, you know, dx, dx on r, plus 1 over 2m, dx r times dx, plus the same thing with y's, plus x squared y. And we have the commutation relations here of, uh, of dx with, with r. Uh, so we would get uh, minus 1 over 2mr dx uh, times uh, ix, I guess. Ix uh, from this one, because it's dx with r, not with r dx. And uh, then for, for this one, we would get again a minus. Uh, 1 over 2 m r, actually we should be careful with the r here, this is 2 m r, uh, i x, times 2 x, plus the same of y. Okay. So what we found, what we concluded is that, okay, I mean, uh, you, can, you can look at this a little bit more deeply, uh, uh, but you realize that this is not zero. So what you get by doing this, you get four terms, these two plus two more with y's, they are actually not zero. So th that's the statement that the Hamiltonian does not commute with the constraint that, 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 that I made up here. So this is how you would prove it. So what we now do with this, and uh, in the next like, three minutes I'm going to leave you with a little bit of a, of a puzzle. Um, what we do with this is we change variables. We can, if we change from x and y to the variables r and theta, where theta is the angular variable, so r again is this variable, theta is that one. Now, how would we? Uh, so, so basically, I would write x as r cosine theta, y is r sine theta, then, and we can also work with this, uh, this stuff in the tutorial, but uh, we, can, uh, we can find that p theta, so the momentum conjugate to theta, is uh, x py minus y px, what does this remind you of? Angular momentum, and it turns out that p theta commutes I'm kind of skipping a few steps here, but we have a tutorial also to, to go through some of these things. And now we also get the R, which is the, the variable, uh, the, the other conjugate variable, uh, the other variable in these coordinates, and it turns out that the R does not commute. So what we've done, we've basically identified which part of our Hamiltonian does not commute. So when we write our final Hamiltonian, again, this is a simple change of variables, and we can look at it in the tutorial, but the final Hamiltonian is going to be something like this. This is the radial part, plus 2mr squared, that's the angular part, plus lambda r minus a. And we see that, I mean, the reason for doing it is to isolate which part of the Hamiltonian does not respect the constraint. Okay. And that's this part. Okay. I think it's kind of obvious, right? I mean, it, the momentum along the r direction is the one that takes you out, away from r equals a. If you move uh, with the angular momentum along the circle, that preserves r equals a. So intuitively, it's very obvious that this is the part of the Hamiltonian that moves you away from r equals a. It wants to increase or decrease your radius. Well, this is fine. So the normal approach to quantizing this system, uh, they, you know, to avoid the, these complications with the constraints not being, uh, uh, not being sensible, is simply to set this term to zero. So you take a term of Hamiltonian and by hand, more or less, you impose that that term is zero. And then you use words to explain it, like what you've actually done. Okay. Uh, and uh, 
so basically the words you use are very similar to what you use with gauge symmetry when you fix a gauge. So this is not very different, as we'll talk about next time, to the gauge fixing that I discussed in the first half of the lecture, where by hand you have a term that kills some of your gauge symmetry. So here you have some operator that you impose them to exist, and uh, as, as a last, uh, so now you get the Hamiltonian commute with your uh, constraints, but you have to restrict to states which satisfy the constraint. Okay. So when you quantize your system, you create states, but now you have an extra, now you have to impose your constraint on the states themselves. So you basically see you only look at these kinds of states, which satisfy the constraint. And these are called physical. So you get into the same kind of trouble that you would get in a gauge theory when you, you, know, you fix the gauge, and then you end up with some states that are unphysical. In that case, there were these negative normal states. And, but if you restrict to a subsector, which you call the physical subsector, then everything is fine. If you can do that consistently, and you can, of course, in the simple model, then, uh, then everything is fine. So you have actually this is a or a consistent way of quantizing this model. And you don't need BRSD or you know, any more fancy method of quantization. But uh, I will proceed next time with talking about BRSD for this model, because uh, it's just a simple model where you can see everything working out, and uh, then it will be easier to understand the extension to gauge systems, to proper gauge systems.